What every Adventist scientist should know, the subject today being paleocurrents. We've been doing a series on what every Adventist scientist should know. Uh, we talked about the philosophy of science first. We've covered, um, um, is there a God? Various questions that can be raised and various subjects that should be explored. Um, we've talked about how old is life on Earth and was there a flood and today we are doing the last of those, except that we will have to, well, I take it back, we have to redo the, uh, the origin of life on, on, uh, uh, on the is there a God section. There are challenges to young life creationism, and we've covered two of them. We hope to cover two more, ice cores and radiometric dating. And uh, we uh, will be privileged to hear uh, Dr. Leonard Brand discuss Ellen White's health messages tomorrow, uh, pardon me, next week. Uh, but for this week, we're gonna talk about paleocurrence and my apologies because I did not change this slide. Um, uh, that should read uh, paleocurrents, and uh, first we're going to give uh, the main reference and then uh, let you uh, get an idea of where you can find others. We'll talk about the theory of paleocurrents, we'll talk about the data, and then we'll give you my take, which will be fairly short, um, and then uh, the floor will be open for comments and questions. First, I'm going to talk about references, and it primarily they have to do with Dr. Arthur Chadwick, who's c collected, I think literally, in the terms of a million references or so. Um, Dr. Chadwick has a PhD in biology from Miami University, and has done postgraduate training in geology, and has worked a lot in geological stuff, including some publishing. And uh, is currently chair of biology and ge geology departments at Southwestern Adventist University. And the website where he has most of this stuff posted is um, geology.swau.edu slash paleocurrents one underline one dot html. Uh, he has um, uh, a number of different um, uh, pictures that you can look at, and it's probably worth your while to to uh, peruse them at your leisure. Um, there are other sites, and they, one of them, interestingly enough, includes Wikipedia, which discusses paleocurrents. Paleocurrents are not a mystery. It is what Dr. Chadwick has done with putting the data together that is so interesting. And I have basically stolen his slides, well, with his permission. And so what I'm going to do is to go through the kind of talk that he would do. What are paleocurrents? Where do we get them? How can we visualize them? What are the results from North American and other cratons throughout geological time? What can paleocurrents tell us about the attribution of sedimentary environments in the standard model, and how can we use this information to better understand the history of the Earth. Those are the subjects that we're going to talk about. And the first little bit is going to be very uncontroversial. Why paleocrines? The ability to recreate the salient features of some or many past events involving the movement of water on the Earth's surface through time could provide a distinct advantage to understanding those events. If you know which way the current was going when um, sediments were laid down, it might tell you something. And in fact, it tells you quite a bit, uh, which is fascinating. Um, some of the uh, ways that you can tell what's going on is cross bedding. If you will look carefully, you will notice that the dunes are being blown uh, from right to left and laying down cross beds. 
And here's what you can see in the fossil record. And you can see the fossil record has these beds that are laying, being laid down. And they're being laid down, in this particular case, from left to, to right. Therefore, either the wind or the water, whichever, is, being, is pushing the sediments from left to right. Very uncontroversial. Here's another example. This time it's going from right to left. Um, the, the slide is actually being used to show some other features that are interesting, but, uh, uh, but the part that has the paler currents that are easy to d detect are coming from a direction. It's obvious we're talking about moving either water or air in this case. Ripple marks can happen. This is uh, more common under water than it is under air. And here you can see, um, obviously, the flow is going either from left to right or from right to left. You can tell it's not going from top to bottom. But if the ripples are relatively symmetric, it's pretty hard to tell for sure which direction they're coming from. So you need a little more information. Um, here is some actual fossil ripple marks. And you can see that it's very similar to what we have in the present. Um, here's another example, and it's fossil orientation. And at first, you would think, well, obviously, those shells must be lined up with the current. But which way? Uh, then if you think about it, you realize the current has to go from the left lower left to the upper right. And the reason why is because these shells are going to be unstable. And as they roll, they're going to roll so that the big end is down current. If they, if they start with the little, end, uh, down current, uh, the little end down current, then they will tend to roll around until they reach the equilibrium position. So the, in this case, you can tell not only that the current is flowing and that it is flowing somewhere in a uh, left to right direction, but you can say that you're pretty sure that it is from left to right and not vice versa in contrast to those ripples. There's uh, some other uh, things that you sometimes see in stone. And this in particular is scour marks, where you can see that uh, something has scraped the stone. Um, and it's going from left to right or right to left. You'd have to have some other features before you could save for dead sure. Um, but it does kind of look like um, certainly it's not flowing up and down. What patterns of paleo currents tell us in a continental scale? Well, that's an interesting question. It doesn't occur to most people. And that's where Art Chadwick, I think, has advanced the study. What do we expect to see from the standard geological model? What do we actually see? And does the standard model fit the data? Well, if you answer questions one and two differently, then obviously the standard model doesn't fit the data. And the next question is, what can we learn in the process? Well, what does the standard model predict? Well, if you look at North America, you will notice that there are various sedimentary basins. There's the Mississippi Basin. There's the St. Lawrence Basin. Um, there is a river that runs towards, the, towards Hudson Bay in, in Canada and the very northern United States. There's the Columbia River. Um, that's kind of been left all together along with the Yukon. There's a small river that runs up into the Arctic here. Um, there's the Utah Basin that doesn't drain anywhere. Just drains into um, Great Salt Lake and various other lakes that uh, collect water and then dry up uh, when the rain stops falling. And there are, other, there are other ones that haven't been drawn. For example, the Colorado Basin, uh, which is part of this red area. Um, but so you have multiple basins, and, you, and what you expect is things to run towards the center of the basin and then out the river. And so, for example, if you have a geologic map of the United States, um, 
what you will see is uh, uh, drainage towards the central basin, drainage away from mountains, drainage into basins, into other basins, into other basins, and then rivers that, that take them out to sea, drainage that here runs into the Great Basin, um, into depressions, and then in the, in the west it's quite complex because you have drainage away from mountains. But in all, there's no overlying pattern. And if you look at the geologic column, there's places where you will see this, for example, in the Precambrian. Um, then we're going to talk about the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. Um, in most flood scenarios, the Paleozoic is the earliest part of the flood. Mesozoic is part of the flood. Cenozoic, it's de debatable exactly where in the flood that came, or whether it came after the flood. Um, so let's take a look at those uh, drainage, pa uh, those uh, paleocurrents, and see what they look like. Well, in the, in the Precambrian, you do have kind of uh, some directional component to it, but with a lot of exceptions, um, and uh, for example, you could assume that this was once a basin here because it has uh, currents running to it from both sides. Now, if you look at the Cambrian, uh, or the, this is the Paleozoic in general, and you'll notice that all of a sudden you have a pattern that looks like it covers almost the entire continent. You've got a little bit of mix-up up in here, and you've got a kind of a, you might call it an eddy formation there. Uh, outside of that, you have pretty consistent flow patterns through the whole continent. Which is very interesting and unusual, and um, artists showed this to uh, geologists, and they're, about the time they see this kind of a pattern, their eyes start bugging out. Uh, this is the Cambrian, so we're, we're going to take it layer by layer. And you can see in the west, it's just all solid going west. In the south, it's kind of swirled around to going south. Um, in the east, you're having flow that, that kind of curves around here and goes east. But it's a, it's a continent-wide pattern. And this is not what you would expect from modern terrain. Now, in case you're wondering about um, the colors, the white is not, often doesn't have Cambrian in it. Uh, but if it does, it'll be very isolated patches. Um, this is interpreted nowadays as shallow water deposit, and this is interpreted as deep water deposit. And if you go to the website, you can actually find a key to that. Um, the red stuff is volcanic. So apparently this is swirling around a volcanic area. Lordovician. Again, and now, the east, now the eastward is mostly east and maybe a little bit to the south. Uh, you're starting to get a little bit less uniformity in the west with some of the currents flowing west. But in general, the pattern is east to west. The uh, Silurian, um, where it's most documented, again, is, is in the east. And again, you're looking for mostly westward, but with, with some in the center of the country kind of coming around down to the south. And the west, with limited data, you're still going west. Um, the Devonian, again, you're seeing a pattern in the east, all going east, with some mix-up in the west. Um, on relatively sparse data. I believe um, 
Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the Devonian missing from the Grand Canyon? Yeah, so, so if you're looking at it, that's why you don't see a lot of data in some of these places because the layers are just not there. Yeah, well, I should have given you this before I asked. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, the Ordovician and Silurian are, are uh, mostly missing, and that's why you have uh, such sparse data in the West in this area. Um, <coughs> then if you look at the um, uh, Mississippian, which is part of the Carboniferous, um, again, the East is fairly uniform. Now we're having a fairly large component of uh, material that's moving East from the West. Uh, but it's a, it's, again, it's a very large component. You'll notice that you don't have those little bitty basins that we have today. Um, and the uh, Pennsylvanian, now you have a pattern that pretty much covers the entire continent with um, uh, northward uh, currents in, in the uh, St. Lawrence area. Uh, with pretty much eastern to swirling around to southern current, and then in the in the west mostly moving south. And um, then uh, finally in the Permian, mm. very little material in the east, so we don't have much data. But in the in the west, you'll notice that it's almost all going south at this point. Now that pattern continues through the first part of the Mesozoic. You have, uh, this is the total Mesozoic and you'll notice you have a lot of material flowing now back east. Um, but we'll take it uh, layer by layer in the Triassic, we're still having a lot of westward movement. And we're still having westward movement in the eastern United States as well. But in the Jurassic, it suddenly reverses. Now everything seems to be flowing from west to east in the east with the continued eastward movement of the eastern United States. And uh, now more southerly in the uh, extreme west. Now unfortunately I don't have uh, drawings for the um, Cretaceous. My understanding is they more or less follow the same pattern. In the Paleogene, this is a rose diagram which is combining everything and so you don't see the patterns quite as much but you'll notice that you do have a fairly strong southerly component in the Paleogene, that's just, or Paleocene, oh, Paleogene, it is. Um, that's Paleogene. That's the lower part of the Cretaceous. That, that's the, uh, the tertiary. Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene. Oligocene. And then as you get further on, you get a pattern that's, again, pretty much totally random. Suggesting that this is the place in the Neogene where the drainage pattern now starts to mm -hmm. approximate what we have for modern, the modern drainage pattern. To summarize, in the Precambrian, the North American paleocurrents are variable and don't really show a distinctive continent-wide pattern. In the Paleozoic, the paleocurrents show patterns that are continent-wide and typically flow toward the southwest across the continent with, as you can see, some little swirls involved. In the Mesozoic, the patterns are continent-wide and typically flow towards the east across the continent, um, except for the extreme east where it still continues to flow west. In the Cenozoic, North American paleocurrents are again variable and do not show continent-wide patterns, especially during the late Cenozoic. Mm -hmm. 
Now, these trends are not expected in the standard model conventional basinal geology. You'd expect everything to look like the Precambrian. The trends show that processes were active that were larger than those predicted by the standard model, suggesting that the model may be inadequate. Such trends seem to be consistent with an actualistic process such as the Genesis Flood, but of course there are other explanations that could be forthcoming. Further work needs to be done to unravel difficult areas such as Europe and Britain. Um, but we're going to take a look at South America in just a little bit. There's patterns on other continents. One problem that uh, Dr. Chadwick notes that is that workers within the standard geologic model do not typically think on this scale. Evidence of continent-wide trends is anomalous, but occasionally has been recognized. Basin-limited supercontinental paleocurrents were one of the lines of evidence supporting plate tectonics. What was happening outside the basin? And then he asked, can we see any supercontinental trends in paleocurrent patterns? And if so, what did they tell us? And we're going to take a look at some of those. Um, in South America, Precambrian is very scar uh, scarcely represented, so you don't really see too much. What you do see looks pretty scattered, going west, going east, going west. In the Paleozoic, in Brazil, uh, especially in the tip, you're getting some pretty uniform eastward movement. West. I'm sorry, westward movement, you're correct. And, um, and, and that goes all the way into southern Argentina, where you, or, or northern Argentina, where you start getting, or I guess this is actually Uruguay and Paraguay, where you start getting material that looks like it's starting to flow upwards. The um, Andean region is kind of a mixed bag. Uh, in the Mesozoic, you get more uniform flow, mostly westward again, or mostly eastward again, I'm sorry, from the west. And, um, and you have reversal of the uh, flow that you had earlier in, in Brazil, although the very tip of Brazil continues to flow uh, uh, in the in a westward direction. <coughs> and then the more modern material is kind of scattered. Um, in Africa, the Precambrian is is more or less scattered. Um, you've got some patterns. <coughs> Interestingly here, you have um, a pattern that is flowing off um, to the west, and we're going to see that pattern become important uh, later on. And then predominantly southerly and in this area, northeasterly flow. Uh, in the, in the, let's see, read that, Mesozoic, again you're having, uh, you're having a pattern that uh, is flowing, at, this time pretty much continent-wide, in a northwest direction, with some um, curving down to southwest in the, uh, in the area of, uh, uh, Nigeria and the Congo. And then this one is tertiary. And here the trend is a little bit more scattered, although you're still having a fairly continuous uh, run here with the interruption. So you're starting to get more of a basinal geology. It's not quite as dramatic as North America, but it is uh, where we have, by the way, more data, both because there are more geologists in North America and because there's more material that shows ripple marks and uh, other indicators of flow. 
In Australia, Precambrian, uh, somewhat scattered. Um, Paleozoic, a mm, little bit more of a pattern, but uh, still with some swirling Mesozoic, now you're starting to get a little more of an indicator uh, of flow, and, and now the tertiary, also known as the Cenozoic, um, now, you're, now you're starting to get uh, uh, some scattered, but actually you could call that a you could call that a decent pattern in Australia, suggesting that maybe um, some of the flood sediments were deposited in different, uh, with different uh, mechanisms. In India, the, the Precambrian is uh, largely east to west, but with a significant amount of scatter. Um, in the Paleozoic, you're getting some flow that looks like it's starting to uh, be more coherent. And again, in the Mesozoic, now you have flow that's in the opposite direction, uh, or nearly opposite direction from what it was during the Paleozoic. And then finally, the tertiary, which is totally scattered. Now what's interesting is to look at what happens to the Earth if you put all the pieces back together. As most of you know, plate tectonics argues that once upon a time there was a single continent and that, for example, South America, which is right here, fit into Africa. The shapes will be a little distorted because this is a Mercator view of the Earth. Um, and you'll notice that Africa is near the South Pole at this point. North America is here. Now what's interesting is you have uh, some scatter in this area, but as you keep going, you get, um, you get flow in Africa that looks like it corresponds to North America. And if you go a little further, uh, you can see that the African flow here and the, South Ameri uh, the North American flow in fact, matches pretty well, as does some of this material in the uh, um, some of the material that's split off of Europe. And in fact, what's particularly striking is, as this is supposed to have kind of changed place with time, here you have Africa and South Ameri uh, North America fitting very nicely together, and Africa and South America flowing clear across each other. And in fact, in North America, South America, you can argue that there's a, there's a pattern of material that goes in and then perhaps around and then back out. Mm -hmm. And here starts to meet resistance from presumably newly rising mountains. It's not perfect, but it is interesting. Continent-wide paleocurrents are unexpected or anomalous, but recognized and perhaps could be accommodated in the standard model. Supercontinental, where you're talking about things that go across two or three continents, are unexpected and unrecognized and probably cannot be accounted in, uh, accommodated in the standard model, although I'd hesitate to call this a silver bullet. An actualistic process such as the global catastrophic flood is consistent with the observations and is worthy of further consideration. Now my own take on this is uh, I think there is evidence of worldwide flooding, certainly evidence of continent-wide flooding. And it's easiest to interpret as a worldwide flood. Now, this flooding must either be repeated again and again. First in the Cambrian, then in the Ordovician, then in the Silurian, then in, um, and so you have multiple worldwide floods that just keep repeating themselves, or it's part of one massive event. Now, 
I think that you can argue that it's easiest to do the um, Occam's razor thing and uh, say it really supports a global flood, one global flood, in which case you're looking at relatively short age. And I think that's what's even more interesting is collected by someone interested in the age and flood controversy, which means that interest in the controversy and willingness to look at both sides of, of the question becomes uh, an important way to advance science to find out things that you didn't know before that will hold true. Um, and therefore, uh, it's an example of how science, how, if you please, people who are interested in creationism can do good science. Uh, and I think that it's arguable that this kind of information should be at least presented to students who take geology in Adventist and I would argue other Christian institutions. But that's my take. <coughs> now it's your turn. Go ahead. I have a question that may be totally off the wall, but I, as you go up, the so-called geologic scale, the patterns change, and I just thought, oh, I wonder if they could have an animation of how the different layers change, and if that might say anything about how the flood acted on, you know, how the layers and all that mm -hmm. took place, or, would, or does it, would it work that way? Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, I think so, and I think it's a, it's a good idea. Now, it's going to take somebody who's relatively familiar with the data and who perhaps could take and show how the deposits moved around with time uh, and could show how the currents moved as the deposits were moving. It would be very interesting to see whether the currents are following the movement of, of C versus no deposit. Um, does it look like you know things are going being washed to one side? Um, and it could at least theoretically be simply animated, certainly, and possibly more in more detail. Uh, you could even, if you had the data, you could even try to you know separate it by. Uh, stages of the Ordovician, for example, and have the currents pop up here and have some kind of a, an indicator as to how many data points we have that are pointing all in the same direction or perhaps 90% in the same direction. Um, so there's a lot of extra work that could be done on the data we've collected. Uh, there's also a lot of data that could be collected. For example, we have barely touched China and Russia. Um, and uh, that's partly because there aren't as many geologists that have been working on this and, um, uh, and partly because Art Chadwick doesn't read Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, and, and it's interesting because this is the kind of thing that could actually be crowdsourced. You could have some high school kids that wanted, you know, all they wanted to do is to, to, and they already read Russian, say, you know, go into the literature and see, well, do they have paleocurrence here? Do they have paleocurrence there? And, uh, you know, um, then have somebody verify them and, and put them into the database and, and see what kind of uh, a pattern we get or if it's a totally random uh, arrangement. I noticed that you had uh, some volcanic activity on some of those layers. And I was wondering how much ash uh, would be then mixed in with the mud on those layers or the, the subsequent layers. I don't have a good answer for that. Um, this is a massive database. 
uh, one of the things I would hope is eventually <coughs> that not only all of the uh, all of the uh, data are there, but also all of the uh, papers are are put online, or at least put uh, the references are put online, so that anybody that wants to can go and check mm -hmm. to see you know how good the uh, uh, evidence is. And um, I think that's one of the things that will be particularly of value here is to have some kind of a, uh, uh, you know, if you don't believe our results, you can always go read about them in the original papers. Um, I guess we have a comment way in the back. Does uh, anybody have an idea if the uh, direction of paleo currents can be obtained from core samples to try to sort of fill in the, the blank areas? My guess is it's mm -hmm. not as easy to do on core samples as it is to do, I mean, you can see the ripple marks. If you were to core those, you know, you're talking about, what, a three or four inch, it'd be pretty hard to to be sure as to where, uh, which direction the, the current was going. <coughs> uh, you might have a better idea if you had some kind of cone-shaped uh, shells like the, uh, uh, like the one example, because that would be pretty much, but you still, you'd like to see a larger area of shells that are all going the same direction before you, before you could be comfortable saying that that wasn't just random. Well, you might go longitudinally, longitudinally down the down the core, and if it's consistent through a period of, you know, depth, then uh, if all the shells for any inch or or, or perhaps a a foot are all oriented the same direction, right. then you might think that that whole thing was laid down with current. In one so direction. I also wonder about asymmetric, uh, sort of elongated rocky debris, whether those would tend to line up as well. Yes, um, I didn't show you, but there are, online there are um, actual photographs of where rocks have had water rushing over them and they do tend to uh, align with the uh, flow of the rock. And you can see that from modern material. <coughs> and I wonder how, s how small that gets. In other words, if something down the size of uh, grains of sand orient themselves, in which case that, that could be taken from a core sample. I don't know if anybody's actually looked at that. Yeah. Uh, one feature that uh, wasn't mentioned in, in orientation and, uh, is the size of the grains. As uh, you follow a sediment, it uh, goes from coarse to fine uh, because sediments are much heavier than water and tend to settle out of water. Uh, but uh, the smaller ones, are upheld, held much longer and transported much further than the coarser parts of the sediment. So, uh, could you pick that up in a single core? Possibly not. Uh, certainly, in several cores you could. But in a single core, you can pick up orientation of uh, fossils, orientation of granules. Uh, that's commonly used in uh, telling directions. Mm -hmm. So, you can do some of it. In, if you have several cores. Uh, you can use sediment size. It would be comforting if the shells were all aligned in the same direction as the sediment size. If you had two or more indicators uh, pointing in the same yeah, direction. Yeah, sure, and, and probably sometimes that is done. You know, they, they use every which every trick they can in trying to determine this. Uh, uh, you get the most out of your data. Do you know what scientific exposure this information has uh, has received? Well, um, I, I don't know for sure because I haven't done the research in that. I have heard that um, answers in uh, Genesis uh, picked up on this at one point, but I haven't actually read the material. How about Origins? Um, answers in Genesis. <coughs> How about Origins, the journal Origins? Uh, uh, 
there has not been much publication on this. So one publication that uh, I don't know why Art doesn't uh, mention it. He did produce an abstract, and uh, it was an abstract given at a scientific meeting of one of the major geological societies. I think you can find the reference in my book, Origins, if you're looking at it, for it. Uh, and to me, that is the only scientific publication about this that, uh, that I know of. Uh, but there, there he talks about, uh, especially the North American and the, uh, the rather striking uh, evidence in the uh, Paleozoic uh, for North America. If you notice, that, that, that was rather a striking pattern there. That's mentioned in that. Uh, uh, he did, uh, as you mentioned, uh, have a geology professor from the university not very far from here I'll look at this stuff and so on and uh, what can you say you know it's not what you'd expect in terms of random distribution of sediment deposition that is going now on the continents where your rivers travel in different directions your lakes sediments go into the lakes in all kinds of directions and so on uh, here you have uh, a striking difference, at least for the Paleozoic of the North America, uh, that uh, it's hard to answer unless you, you know, think in terms of catastrophism, major worldwide catastrophism. Uh, other data probably more, uh, but uh, as far as I know, that's the only uh, exposure in the scientific literature uh, to this and. Uh, like uh, many of us, uh, we look at the research, like uh, my research on the termite nests and so on. I have an abstract published on that, but I've never prepared a long paper on it because it uh, well, always seem to be more urgent things to do than uh, embellish the uh, scientific literature and uh, whatever that means nowadays. I, I think that for some of this, if we don't get into the scientific literature, we should at least be getting it into the creationist literature so that it's out there. Yeah, well, uh, he's done that in terms of uh, his web page. All this data that you saw today, it's on his web page. Uh, it's there, it's available, and several different articles that he has in there uh, cover that. So it, it's available there in, in respect to that. To, uh, it's kind of one page. of those sleepers, you know, just, it, it's not, uh, and once you look at it, you realize, yes. you know, this is a continent-wide pattern, which implies at least continent-wide flooding. Um, <laughs> and there are other indicators of the same kind of thing. For example, a good share yeah. of the material from the Grand Canyon actually comes from the Appalachian Mountains, which happens to be the direction of the flow. But it, uh, there is a lot of stuff out there and so on. Some of it, like uh, popular songs, uh, makes it out there in the viral world of the internet, and some of it is ignored. Uh, this, this is normal pattern. What, and what determines what is uh, accepted or is popular well, it depends on several factors. Uh, one of them has to be simple. Uh, secondly, it has to be timed at a certain time when something else isn't competing. And I think it also helps that if it's a, just a little bit controversial. I uh, suppose so if it's controversial, yeah, that makes more interest. Uh, more interest. But th th this is not uh, the significant part. Is the data. Uh, and once you have that uh, out there, which he has at least to a certain extent in that one abstract, uh, I think uh, it's available. This is a... Um relatively short presentation, so hopefully it will be uh, something that they, that uh, 
could be uh, used uh, or used as a basis for looking at things in the mm -hmm. in uh, in Adventist education. It doesn't take a long time to make the points that I think are most important. Um, and I think it is comforting for a creationist to realize that there's massive movement of water. In the same direction. In the same direction. And in certain parts. Uh, and, and for the repeated <clears throat> flooding to come through <clears throat> seems to be a little bit of an ad hoc kind of solution. It makes more sense for flooding that, that is part of one large event. I would add to this uh, picture, if you want to get into the flood issue, is the uh, argument of the tremendously widespread layers that say the same thing. This is, you know, you've got a million square kilometers of Morrison formation from New Mexico up to Canada. Uh, we're not spreading layers around like that at present at all. Uh, and this is this is not a, an isolated case. I mean, just these formations you go out there, and they're incredibly thin, they're incredibly flat, uh, and the topography uh, of that time had to be incredibly flat, and you never lay one flat one on top of another. There's no way you could lay out those formations on our present continents. The topography is way too irregular. Uh, it's a different world out there. This is part of the picture. Well, what's interesting is you put that together with if the Morrison formation is there and all of the flow is in one direction, then that argues even more strongly that the Morrison was made at one time. No, I have not seen data on the Morrison of uh, paleocurrent data on the Morrison. It's available. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it's available. <laughs> uh, I'm very impressed with the Paleozoic data uh, that, that we have for North America. Uh, the uh, Morrison has, suppose, some streams in it, but how do you do that? Morrison's only about, you know, averages uh, 300 feet in thickness, 400 feet in thickness. And a good share of it's conglomerate, which takes a little uh, churning to move that kind of rock. But you've got this, kind of you've got to deposit this kind of stuff. Morrison, you know, it's kind of unique. It's got a lot of volcanic material in it and so on, but it's uh, very colorful, and uh, you, you tell when you're in Morrison usually. And you've got to go with that from New Mexico, or Texas even. Well, there's, some, there's a little bit of Morrison in Texas, very little bit. Uh, clear up to Canada. Can you imagine how you lay that out at such a flat area? And then you have a gap of about 40 million years in parts of it. And you got a thin Dakota that's only about 100 feet thick, spreading over uh, th about 800,000 square kilometers, uh, almost as big as the Morrison. Uh, this is a totally different world than what is going on at present, and it's what you'd expect from a major catastrophe like the flood. Has anybody looked at the answers in Genesis stuff? We're wondering about the verse in the Bible mm. in Genesis where Peleg was born and the earth was divided. He was born after this division. There's some debate as to exactly what that means. Um, there are some who feel uh, that, uh, that this is part of the uh, rifting of the continents. Um, in which case, uh, one would expect mountain building before the eyes of the people who were uh, out of the flood. Um, the other possibility is that um, that the earth being divided has to do with the 
different language groups being split off. And this is the time of the Tower of Babel. Um, and it depends on how you interpret the earth being divided. What is the uh, word? Just a minute. We're going to. So, what is the word, the origin of the word that is used for earth? Is it dirt or is it the world? Because the world was divided when the languages were divided, but. Which, um, I which have verse is it? Uh, oh, pardon me. I'll find it again. Um, it's in Genesis 10, Genesis 10, uh, verse 25. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. Genesis 10. 26. Pardon me, 25. 25. This is Genesis, all right. Should be uh, fairly short. That's odd. Oh, this is that's page numbers. That's why. Um, let's see. There's eleven. Here's ten. Twenty-five. And to Eber was born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his day in his days was divided Haaretz, the earth. So that's talking about physical. That's not talking political or 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 language, right? Well, that's, yeah, that's the, that's the, uh, Haaretz has a, has a large range of, of meaning. Um, it's, uh, it, it's very much like the, the word earth today, uh, where you can talk about the earth and mean the people on the earth. Um, but usually you would say world. Usually it would be the earth. So, so I suppose you'd say that the first, the first thing that would come to mind is that the earth itself was divided. Um, but it's not beyond the range of the linguistic range of the of the uh, uh, of the of the word to 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 mean the people. So at that point, what you have to do is you, while perhaps leaning in one direction, you have to look around and see whether you can make sense out of it in both ways. Well, I'll tell you what, <coughs> I think we've pretty much gone over all that we can for paleocurrents today. Uh, come back next week and we'll be in some senses switching gears, but in another sense uh, looking at another aspect of the same question, which is the interface between science and religion. And uh, we'll be specifically talking about Ellen White and was she a prophet? And what do the health messages have to say about that question and uh, also about how prophecy functions in, as well? And uh, I really invite you to come because I think it's going to be a very interesting subject.